thank you very much. Um, wonderful to be back here. I'm going to race through some slides because from my memory of last time uh, I came to speak to you, we had much more fun when we got to question time. So I'll just set some context. Um, the question I was asked to talk about was the role of the university, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. You won't be too surprised to realise that there are many answers to that question depending on your perspective, but we'll come to that in a moment. I'll give you a brief update on Victoria's progress against the strategic plan that we talked to you about last time I was here, and also talk about how we might engage further with you to help Victoria fill this role that we will define for it in a moment. This was the vision that I spoke to you about when I last came to be a world leading capital city university, one of the great global civic universities. I won't dwell on this, but essentially we're positioning the university about around being in a capital city university, and that defines the areas of specialist academic emphasis that we'll take on board. Things like public policy, public administration, international relations, international law, strategic studies, those sort of things but also the, the parts of the economy that suit with Wellington, the creative arts, the digital economy, uh, designed there by value manufacturing. So that's the way we're basing the university's um, uh, focus. It's still a comprehensive university and it will remain such, but there has to be areas of specific emphasis in universities in modern day uh, to compete on the global stage. And then the term global civic, we spend a little bit of time about civic universities draw back to the red brick uh, university era in which Victoria, in which Victoria was born. Uh, this is where universities began to realise they needed to be engaged uh, in their communities and be part of their communities instead of just being that distant, critic and conscious that the earlier universities had uh, championed. And, the, and in modern days, that is now in a global context. You're part of your, your community, but you link local to global and global to local, and you have to be judged at the world standards of excellence, not just local excellence. Uh, from an update, uh, this is uh, some of the stats that um, we've published recently in the paper. Uh, we're top one percent of the oops, sorry of the world, and um, uh, finding the pointer here. Uh, here, top one one percent in a number of different subjects, um, uh, about uh, particularly around the humanities and law and social sciences and management. Uh, we're about top two percent in most of our natural sciences, including engineering. Uh, in, if you look at this. In terms of the number of universities in the world, there's about 7,000 universities in the world. And those are pretty good achievements given the large number of universities in the world. Uh, the law faculty remains in the top 50 of law faculties across the world. And in the top 100, uh, there's a large number of um, subject areas there, some of which I've got listed. Things like English language, art and design, um, developmental study, geography, education, law and sociology. So we're reasonably pleased with where we're standing in the world. This is important because without that standing you can't draw the top people, you can't draw the top students into this community. Uh, we're now about 2,000 staff uh, on a, on a full-time equivalent basis, about 2,500 on a headcount. We've got about 21,000 students on a headcount basis. You'll be pleased to know that we're drawing about 2,000 Jaffers down to the um, university. So 2,000 of our students and our Auckland students that are leaving Auckland and coming to Wellington. This is quite important, uh, not just um, drawing Auckland students here, but drawing young people to Wellington because we are challenged demographically with relatively slow growth predicted and most of that growth being in the retirement age population over the next 15 to 20 years. So we're playing our part in drawing young people to the city and we aim to hold on to those people and get them into jobs in the city, get them to become our own employers of the future. We're putting about $2 million, uh, sorry, about $20 million, 19.5 to be precise, into scholarships now. Um, there's about 3,000 international students coming to Wellington to attend Victoria. Our research revenues are now up at around about 50 million. We talk about this primarily because that shows you the scale of the, of the research uh, engine room at Victoria, but also because these are competitive grants. And if you're not getting uh, good people who are on the money with terms of research relevance and you don't get this sort of research um, income in your university. The business faculty is continuing to go from strength to strength. It has something called the triple crown um, of commerce accreditations, which only about 70 business schools have achieved around the world. That is, it's accredited in its programs by the American authorities, by the European authorities, and its MBA is also accredited internationally as well. And in terms of our finances, 
Um, we are um, focusing on growing the revenues of the university. We don't have a shareholder, and so all of that money that we earn goes back into the university's teaching and research. I talk about this because for a, a decade or more, Vic was meeting its budgets by its savings. And of course, you can't save your way to excellence, so we have to turn this around, focus on getting revenue into the place. Without that revenue, we can't uh, recruit the top people, we can't uh, build the top facilities, so we have to be more revenue orientated. We just finished a study with the NZOER, and we're producing about a billion dollars uh, annually into this economy. Um, we aim to double the size of the university over the next um, about 15 to 20 years, and so with a bit of luck, we'll be producing two billion a year into this economy if we get all that right. Some of you will notice that there's lots of building activity. We're building this building up on the Calvin campus, which is a big biology building, uh, into which uh, our health research, our uh, natural heritage research, um, our um, biotechnology research will be based. On the Pipitea campus, we're also building, and that's uh, to recreate the hub that some of you might have seen in the Calvin campus on the Pipitea campus for the business students and the law students. That's a sort of a, a place where kids can socialise with one another and socialise with members of the, of the city, um, coffee cafes, bookstores, those sort of things, as well as a whole range of small group teaching spaces which we'll be using to help our engagement with the city for, for um, seminars and those sort of things. So that's a bit of a brief update on us, but to the point of uh, what I was asked to talk about, um, what is the role of the university? It seems a simple question. It's not um, particularly easy to reach agreement about this across the different communities of interest for universities. The simplest definition is one around functions. We are involved in research, both fundamental and applied, and that goes all the way through to the commercialisation of that research. We're involved in teaching, but not, a, not just any type of teaching, particularly a research enriched teaching uh, and learning. We're involved with engagement with our communities. This is sometimes called the third mission of universities. So we get out there and take that research and commercialise it. We get out there and make sure our public policy uh, of, this, of this city and of this country can be influenced by the intellectual leadership of the university. And of course, we also have this critic and conscious role which is enshrined in the Education Act statute. And it's a bit of tension to this engagement with the communities. It's what I was alluding to before. When Vic was born in this Red Brick University, it was particularly created to get behind uh, the people of um, this region uh, and to help our culture, our, our, our community, our economy grow. So we're in that bracket, although some would argue in the past we've drifted way too much to that critical conscious role, and I'm trying to bring us back into this engaged university role. Another um, definition of what a university is for is this one here. This is the one that um, I prefer, I, I, um, I believe in very strongly, and that is it's about cultivating intellectual, social and creative capital. Um, a lot of um, institutions of learning create intellectual capital, knowledge. That's what uh, we expect of us as teachers, to transfer knowledge um, to people, and uh, we do that effectively well. But what often people forget about is that we're also about social capital, about people being able to work across different cultures, about working in teams, uh, about things like leadership, and that's a critical part of a university. And the crowning glory to me is this creative capital, it's the capacity of a community to imagine, to uh, understand uh, or to develop new solutions to complex problems. It's sort of the genius behind art and music and, and the arts. It's, um, it's entrepreneurship, it's, it's innovation, it's inspiration, it's leadership. That's what a top quality university does and that's what we're striving for at Victoria. Uh, these are the sort of spaces you need to create that uh, social capital. This is a picture of the hub up in Victoria and you can see the students mingling there in the bottom over coffee with, um, with friends and colleagues in the library's uh, quiet zone at the top where they're actually dutifully studying, um, uh, as our students always do of course. <laughs> Another uh, view on what a university's role is um, comes from the Treasury. Uh, this is actually um, uh, being picked up in the Productivity Commission's review and it's, it's very insightful description of the role of the university from the Treasury quite some time ago. They talk about a fulfilment function. So this is fulfilling individual promise in, in an individual, their development, what they can achieve in our society, and it includes a component of private good. 
There's an integration function. This is the social capital I was talking about before, where, where we instill um, the right um, mores and morals and behaviours for a society to function, civics, if you like. There's an economic function, producing graduates for the workplace, uh, producing research that can be picked up as intellectual property and put into the businesses uh, of our community. Uh, there's an entrepot function, which uh, in French just translates in this sense as warehouse. So we are a repository of knowledge, a repository of culture, of our literature, of our ways of doing things. And of course, there's a research function as well. That's a pretty insightful view from Treasury. Um, when you think about all those functions, you think about what benefits do they lead to is another way of looking at it. And this is an interesting tension because there's an individual benefit when you study the university, but there's also a societal benefit. And that's been a contested concept for quite some time in our society. It's led to various views on who should be paying for what in a university. Uh, so we certainly see a positive individual benefit for a degree qualification at a New Zealand university. It's far less obvious at other uh, tertiary institutions in New Zealand. But someone who picks up a degree at a New Zealand university will have career average earnings of $1.6 million more uh, than someone who does not have a degree. So clear personal gain there. Uh, but from a society perspective, nearly 100% of our leaders, our professionals, our policy advisors, and our so-called knowledge workers are those who are university educated. People who have been to a university are less likely to be unemployed, more likely to participate in the community for simple things like more likely to vote, uh, and more likely to report better health and well-being. So a mix of community and personal benefits there. Uh, one of the um, elements of this question you asked me was what about the uh, nature of the education at universities? And so here's some uh, very quick and brief comments on that. One of the things we try to do at uh, Victoria is to um, offer students the opportunity to know their mind, and you'll see that in our recruitment campaign. So this is about providing flexibility and a wide array of options so uh, students can inspire and find what inspires their future. Now this can be overstated, you know, find your passion, etc. and people can get a bit cynical about this. But it's very interesting to me that some of the country's most entrepreneurial minds have insisted to me that this is the critical role of a university, enabling people to find their passion, and after that, it's all done and dusted. We also aim in our graduate profile for, for students who have a specialised understanding of their field of study, that makes some sense. If you're going to train them in accounts, you'd hope that they know about accountancy. But also the ability to think critically, to think creatively, and to think independently, to have skills in communicating those ideas, and a sense of global citizenship, our place in the world, essential for a trading nation. We aim to find a balance between two other tensions, employment readiness and future employability, and that sense of citizenship. Employment readiness is that skills base that is useful to that first employer, but if we only focused on that, we would shortchange the second employer, the third employer, and on it goes, because most of our students are going to have about four or five or six major career changes, not just within a sector, but across sectors, across the course of their life. So we have to prepare our clients, our students, for that long-term career. So we achieve these aims not just by what we teach, but the way we teach, and we probably don't have time to get into, into that, but there's techniques of teaching that help you uh, deliver these type of outcomes, including experiential learning, which I'm going to come back to in a moment in terms of your role in all of this. So how do you help? Well, firstly, tell us about your personal successes. We love to tell the stories of our alumni and friends in our alumni magazines to our students because you are role models and those role models inspire future success. So don't be shy about that. Uh, we want those stories. Share your views about us, both good and bad. We need this client feedback on the, edu on the educational quality we produce and its relevance to modern day, to your businesses, to your communities. Undertake advisory and governance roles when those opportunities pop up. We need your wisdom in such things. Support our students through advice to them, not just casual advice, but also through long-term mentoring and through workplace opportunities. And this experiential learning that occurs in the workplace is one of the most powerful things you can do for our students to help develop some of those characteristics that I was talking about before. It's one of the distinguishing features of Victoria. We put a lot of effort into that, 
and we're hoping to put a lot more effort into that over the next few years. It also helps to bind these incoming students to our community here in Wellington. Oh, let me skip that one. And of course, lastly, if you if and when you're ready, consider investing in Victoria. Lots of things you can invest in to achieve community benefits. Student scholarships, for example, to widen participation. Uh, research of particular interest to you. We have lots of people doing this now. They have particular issues they want examined in New Zealand society. Uh, our largest ever gift came late last year from Grant and Wendy Nelson in Christchurch. They, invest, they, they granted us $7 million on top of another $3 million that they had previously given us to the Institute of Governance and Policy Studies because they want better government policy formulation. Um, a lot of people like to invest in, in links between our university and others, both for student travel and scholar travel. Um, some like to invest in chairs. Uh, for example, Mark the Knight Chess has just in, invested in a, a, a chair in engineering um, in sustainable energy and provision of critical uh, infrastructure, should you wish to focus on that. So thank you very much, that's all I wanted to say now. Um, and I'm more than happy to take questions, comments, criticisms. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. So, John, first. Uh, there are actually universities in every major city, you know, in New Zealand. So, in what, to what extent does Victoria focus on comparative advantage of Wellington? Thank you, yes. So, about 60% of our en enrolments are now coming from outside the wider Wellington region. Uh, and we do that because um, we focus on the advantages of being a capital city university and on the advantages of being in Wellington. Wellington is by far the best student city in the country, by country mile. It's diverse, it's exciting, uh, it's modern, uh, it's, it's uh, culturally diverse as well as diverse in employment. Um, it's a great place to be as a student and, and our students love it. You that before you went to Massey and Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan. I'm interested in your very aggressive growth plans. Uh, the Bouncy has gone about four times, I think, since in 50 years, growing four times. But partly by overseas students, partly by increasing the percentage of the cohort at 50%. Mm. How will you go further? Mm. Yeah, so um, it's a challenging question for us in a flat demographic in Wellington. Um, so part of what we're trying to do is recruit students from outside the region. Um, Part of what we're doing is putting a lot more emphasis on Marin Pacifica, um, which of course is a growing demographic. Partly it's international students. Partly it's um, supporting the trend of, of um, retraining people after a period in the workforce. So moving from a three year sort of focus at an undergrad degree to four or five, six or seven years where you keep coming back and getting taught masters programs in the areas that you're heading into. Um, partly it's merger and acquisition, which I probably can't go into, um, but uh, there's a bit of that going on as well. Yeah. Um, Grant, I've been uh, hearing about overseas universities in the States and the UK who have got these safe zones set up for traumatic students who've heard a point of view that they don't like. I was just wondering if you've, um, you're based in that issue or are you ready to deal with that uh, in line with your critical thinking? Yeah, um, uh, we, we do have a lot of student welfare issues um, in Victoria and other universities around the, the country because the students are under quite a lot of pressure. Uh, not only are they in full-time study, but they're also often in full-time employment because of the, the student loan issue and trying to make, make ends meet. So we do struggle with quite a lot of issues um, around well-being, I would say, rather than depression. It's sort of, um, uh, it's to do with resilience to pressures and that's what we spend most of our time on, developing resilience. We haven't got to the point where we are model, model, model coddling students away from views they might not want to hear. In fact, we're actively the opposite. Um, we often have to stand up um, to people who don't want us to have particular viewpoints expressed at the university. My own personal view is absolutely um, open university. You can have anyone come and say anything on there and, and people need to be able to learn how to actually understand to, to interact with those unpopular perspectives and to properly debate such things. So no, not quite to that degree, but I don't want to underestimate the pressure on students. It is quite high, um, including the adjustment to um, life away from home and dealing with the lack of rules uh, and all of a sudden that are imposed around you, self-directed study and the like. Tony, 
grand, um, promotion. Uh, Vic uh, Victorious has some wonderful articles in it and some, some really encouraging stories about st what students are achieving at Victoria, but that doesn't seem to get out into the public <coughs> into the, yeah. the popular press and therefore uh, the connection between the university and the city seems to fall apart because of that. Mm. Yeah, it's a really uh, difficult problem for us. So our own media is, um, I think, taking a step up and it's conveying some of these stories much better. Um, we're having to buy parts in the paper, so the Your Victoria column that you'll see I often write, um, which occurs um, every couple of months uh, at the moment, and bring some of these stats we pay for to get in the paper. Um, we find that bad news stories are picked up very quickly. So like, we can't put some students into a wall, yeah, they'll be front page news, but the fact that we have a fellow of the Royal Society last year as one of the most distinguished scientists in the world, in fact, uh, again, we have to pay to get that in the paper. So yes, we haven't cracked that one, um, I'm afraid to say, we've just got to keep working at it. Mm.